This is speech perception part two continued. So the rest of the speech perception um, piece that we're going to do today, March 25th. And at the end, I'm going to do a really short review. I've only received one question so far, and um, I will check one more time before I finish this up. But I thought it's going to be very short, so I'm just, and this is very short, so I'm just going to add the review to the end of this and answer whatever questions I think might be in people's minds in general as much as I can. Another thing that we pick up as we listen, listen to speakers uh, speak, as we listen to the speech stream, is information about char speaker characteristics. So gender, age, whether the voice is familiar, dialect, all of that kind of information. One of the studies that has given us some bit of information about how we're picking up information about speaker characteristics is Palmieri, Goldinger, and Pisoni, 1993. So they had listeners, so they would listen to a list of words uh, being said by a speaker, and then um, later they would have to identify which words were old and which words were new. So they hear a new list of words, but with some old words mixed in there. And they were more rapid, they more rapidly identified a word as old on a list that they had heard before if it was repeated by the same speaker. So it looks like listeners are taking in two levels of information about a word as they're listening its meaning and the characteristics of the speaker's voice. This shows a certain amount of bottom-up processing, right? That we are processing the exact acoustic signal, that when we hear the word signal said by me, that, th that later you're going to recognize that more rapidly said by me signal than said by somebody else because you've taken in that information from a bottom-up kind of way. And, of course, we always have top-down processing as well, uh, especially as I've been saying how much we're listening to uh, context in order to figure out what these speech sounds are and to figure out what people mean. So we know the meanings of words, we have sentences, the context that we've talked about, knowledge, knowledge of rules and grammar, the background knowledge of the speaker, of all of this is going on as we are listening to someone speak. I have already talked about a couple of brain regions that are involved as we're listening to um, people talk. Uh, one is the superior temporal sulcus, as we are imagining to some extent, if you will, the movement of the mouth, um, and then also the fusiform face area, if we are familiar with the speaker, if we know the person who is, is talking at that moment. The other areas, so the areas that we usually talk about as being involved with speech perception and with language in general, are Wernicke's area, which I'm going to talk about as the mental lexicon, where we really hold the meanings of the words that we know, and Broca's area. And if you'll notice, this is up in the frontal lobe, uh, on the left frontal lobe in the left hemisphere, and just in front of our motor cortices. Some of how we know about these areas that in the brain of where we are processing speech are from different kinds of aphasia. So people who have brain damage and we see uh, what are the symptoms of that brain damage, what are they not understanding. And so, as I mentioned, Broca's area is in the frontal lobe. This area was discovered by Pierre Paul Broca. Uh, he had a patient named Tan. And Tan got this name because uh, he seemed to understand what people were asking him, but the only thing he could say in response was Tan. And so that became his nickname. Uh, so he clearly had a great deal of damage. Uh, this, this occurred, um, Pierre Paul Broca wrote this up back in 1860. So this was quite a while ago. And so what they would do back then is they would see a patient with some kind of symptomology, and then after the patient died, they would go in and do an autopsy and say this is where it looks like there was there was damage. Uh, we know quite a bit more about um, these language areas and how they are connected uh, now. And um, I have here, so I'm going to suggest that you go in and watch this link. I usually play a little over two minutes, maybe. Sometimes I've gone as many as four minutes. It really depends um, how, how long you want to watch this. But this is a young woman who um, is in high school, and she has a stroke while she's reading, and she is showing the symptoms of Broca's aphasia. And so I, what I tend to do after all of this is to ask you all to notice the differences, 
So I really do want you to pause and go watch that for just a few minutes and notice what Sarah Scott is struggling with and what she's going through. And I'm going to actually end up giving you some answers because nobody's here to, to talk to me and to give me some answers. Um, but so what's that is, is up in, right in front of those, or it is actually one of the motor areas in the frontal lobe. So this is a, this is an issue of getting those words to, so that we can make a conscious choice about the, the word we want to say. So I'm already going to say it. She's, she's, you can already tell she has this tip of the tongue effect, but she knows she's just, Oh, it's, it's hard to watch her search for that word, each word that she wants to say. Uh, Wernicke's aphasia looks really different. And this um, aphasia, and this brain region was discovered by Carl Wernicke. And it is in the temporal lobe. And again, this is what, where I would say we have our mental lexicon. Um, people's with, people with Broca's aphasia, for the most part, they are understanding speech, unless unless it's something like a passive sentence where it's just the there's just words that are, are marking uh, who's the agent and who's the who's the um, object or the patient uh, if if things are pretty straightforward they tend to understand people with Wernicke's aphasia they're not they're often really not understanding the questions and so if you go in and click in on this link I'm not going to highly recommend that you do that I'm going to read some of, a, of an example of Wernicke's aphasia um, this link is a, an older woman and she has some other uh, issues going on, uh, but you can tell that she's not completely understanding the, the um, nurse or the person who's working with her. And um, that person is giving her some visual cues in order to help her understand. So it's, it's not completely showing just pure Wernicke's aphasia and what typically goes on. And so I'm going to read from, um, this is Ashcraft Cognition. I, I, I usually teach cognitive psychology, and this is just an example of, so experimenters ask uh, the patient about his work before hospitalization, and this is his answer. I want to tell you this happened when happened when he rent. His, his cal come down here and his, he got rent something. It happened. And these rope leaders were with him, and his, his friend, like was, and he wrote in all of these arranging from the pettis on his, on from his pessin. Okay, I make enough speech errors that I did make one speech error in there as far as I could tell. Um, but what you can tell is that this is gibberish and I was trying to talk as quickly and normally as I normally do. They do tend to talk quickly as if they're making sense they have syntactic markers in there. Uh, it sounds like structured language, but um, it's gibberish. And so again, I'll encourage you to just pause and think about the differences of what we see here between Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, and then what that means for what those brain regions, what their um, job is basically in speech perception. Now, some of this I've already been talking about. Some of this is production and what's coming out of their mouths. But what does this mean for as far as what they understand and hear in speech? And if you paused that and thought about that for a moment, I'm going to give you more kind of answers, even though I really kind of gave you a lot of the answers. But so similar to our other everything else we've seen with vision and with hearing and, and sound objects, we have a dorsal root that is not so much like a where root in this case it's more like a, um, a how and a ventral root where we're doing our recognition so the dorsal root is really linking acoustic signal to motor movements there's um, actually this uh, aspect of speech perception where in our minds we are moving our mouths in order to understand or moving our th those articulatory motors in order to understand speech and then ventrally, we see, um, going through the ventral stream, speech recognition. I am actually realizing that I went over this with the saffron at all, but I've already made that into a video, so I'm just going to quickly go over it again um, with the words on the screen. So young infants in all cultures, and no matter what language that we're going to end up hearing and, and understanding and speaking, uh, we can, as infants, distinguish between all of the possible speech sounds. By the age of one, uh, infants have lost the ability to distinguish between some of these sounds, depending on experience. So uh, I can no longer hear the sounds that do not 
have a phonemic uh, difference or do not make a meaningful difference in my language. And before I use the example of the Japanese with the LR distinction, but you can think of it from our perspective of um, English speakers, unless you're really good in Spanish and you've started learning Spanish very young, it's difficult for us to hear the difference between perro in speech, so but in Spanish versus perro, uh, which is dog in Spanish. And it's those little flaps in there, when someone's speaking really quickly, I can't do it in a, in a meaningful way because I don't really speak Spanish, but it's really difficult for us to, to hear and we really have to depend on context. Those are pretty much ambiguous words, whereas they are distinctive. That's a distinctive phonemic difference uh, to people who grow up hearing and understanding and speaking Spanish. So we come back to our summary slide and I will encourage you again to just pause for a moment. I'm hoping I leave enough time that you, get, that you all can watch the videos, pause, and it hasn't gone over an hour and 15 minutes. I think I'm doing pretty well. Uh, but you can think about how do we know where words begin and end? How do we handle differences within and between speakers? And what is a speech sound and how do we recognize it? I'm going to provide a little a little bit because um, again usually I have students uh, answer these questions and I just kind of go with that because it's a nice uh, summary of whatever people got out of all of this but um, we talked about how we it's very difficult to tell uh, where words begin and end in another language but we have learned in our language um, what the words are and we and we're using these transitional probabilities what syllables and sounds are likely to follow what other syllables and sounds within a word. There are rules to these things and we and we are we've learned this um, statistically implicitly. How do we handle differences within and between speakers? Uh, again we use a lot of context and we have this kind of categorical perception such that even though there is lots of variance of exactly what phoneme, what a phoneme might sound like coming from somebody from the South when we're saying um, bat versus somebody from um, New York City if they're saying bat or someone from Chicago if they're saying bat and yet we have we hear those as ah. Uh, we might notice that there are dialectal differences but we hear the ah as ah usually. And yet, and if we, and if, if, if there's this real ambiguity, like then and than, some people say those very similar to each other and they end up messing up their writing because they sound similar in their own, in their own minds. But if there is ambiguity, we use context, right? Okay, and what is a speech sound and how do we recognize it? So I'm going to, a speech sound is basically, I'm talking about phonemes there, right? Phonemes are the speech sounds. We have allophones in the way that we create these different speech sounds, but the speech sounds are what we're hearing, the representation of sound in our mind as we're hearing someone is a, is a phone or phonemes put together. And we recognize them really, again, from context. Uh, context and sentences and grammar all help us figure out what those sounds are. And, um, we, and because of that categorical perception, uh, because we put we have categorical boundaries of where uh, something can fit as a particular phoneme okay so it is now 12 37 and i just checked my email and i haven't gotten any more questions from students so i looked through the review for the second exam and i did go ahead and i have updated online i will not ask about chapter 14 we did not get to talking about the cutaneous senses and actually one of the questions so i had one student ask me a couple questions and one of those questions was about the cutaneous sentences or uh, the you could the cutaneous senses the sense of uh, touch and the sense of pain where I talk about the plasticity of, of S1. We have not gotten to that yet, so let's just um, um, ignore that for the moment. Um, the other question, so I'll go ahead and take the student questions first, or the student question. <laughs> it is just one. Uh, so uh, Reed Davis asks about saccades and fixations, uh, saccadic eye movements and fixations. If you remember when we talked about visual attention, I had one picture from Goldstein and actually an old picture from Goldstein that was showing the saccades, so those saccadic eye movements as red lines, 
uh, those saccadic eye movements last usually um, about 25 milliseconds. So uh, on the order of uh, 20th of a second, it's they're very, very fast. During that time, we are completely suppressing visual information. So we and then we are landing, our eyes are landing, uh, we're fixating. And um, those fixations are called uh, the landings are called fixations. And that is when we are taking in information. And really, as we make saccades, we have that iconic memory and we're just kind of keeping in store uh, what we just looked at in the last fixation. And then we move our eyes, kind of put that together as this is my this is my visual world. So the saccadic eye movements are the quick uh, movements of our eyes on a scene and the fixations are where we land and take in information. I actually showed the Landmark College the, the example of someone with dyslexia and if you go in and you actually have to play the slideshow in order to see uh, quote normal readers fixations and saccades and how they are moving nice they're moving forward through the sentence and they have these the size of the dots are giving us the time the fixation time and they're um, not spending a lot of time on a lot of words. If we go in and look at the dyslexic reader, they uh, have some very large blue dots. There are times when they are just looking at a word for a very long time as they're trying to decode that um, probably most dyslexic readers have problems getting to the phonology um, from the graphemes. So, and then we also see, if you'll notice in that, there's a lot of um, psychotic eye movements, so they're re making regressions, as they're called, as they're moving around in the text. Okay, so that's the one question that I've that I've received. Um, I will get the exam online. I have never put an, an, an entire exam online like this, so I'm going to see how this works. It will go up Monday morning. It will be up Monday, March 30th, and Tuesday, March 31st. You will have an hour and a half to work through it and actually I'm thinking of dropping two of the multiple choice questions so that it feels like if somebody's kind of somebody's kind of slow on the computer or if your computer's running more slowly that um, you have time so I'm giving you a little bit more time than you usually have for class uh, it, it will be a forced completion you'll need to finish it in that hour and a half you cannot just leave it and come back you need to go ahead and take the exam as if you're taking the exam in class you're going to, if I can figure out how to get you to agree officially, you are agreeing, I'm telling you, that you're agreeing not to use any materials for that exam. You really don't have time to go look up um, answers to questions anyway. So just take the exam, do the best that you can, you know, breathe, trust that you know what you need to know. Uh, and then um, I will put up a, uh, an untimed exam that you can use materials for after after that and we'll we'll figure out test corrections so go back and read that announcement if i'm if this is getting confusing for you i'm just trying to explain what that announcement was was saying and i will do that one more time before the exam goes live okay so i've looked through and tried to anticipate or think about the questions that are usually asked usually one of the big questions i get is um uh, what are the short answer questions going to be and I usually try not to tell you too much, since uh, especially since it's going to be online. I don't want you just going and answering it ahead of time. And then, um, yeah, <laughs> but you will notice in there that there is under hearing to location and organization, there is a hint under perceptually organizing sounds in a scene. This is actually something that we have gotten practice with a couple of times now, right? Once in class and once in the discussion, too. So. Um, hint, you may want to think about how you would discuss how we organize or group perceptual information from various modalities since we have discussed that in class. And in this case, I'm really talking about sound because that's as far as we've gotten. Um, seems like there was one more thing I wanted to say about the exam. Uh, so do feel free to email me. I will, so from now on, I'll just have to answer people over email and you won't be helping your um, colleagues. Uh, do think about going back through slides and, and making sure things make sense to you uh, ahead of time. All right, hope you all are doing well and I will, I will not have another lecture online until Wednesday, a week from today.